The Valsalva maneuver can be triggered anytime you're trying to pass a bowel movement. Maybe you're trying to lift 80% or greater of your one rep max in weightlifting, or maybe you're trying to bring a heart rate back down to normal due to supraventricular tachycardia. There is a wide range of uses, but in this video, we're gonna take a look at exactly what it is, what it does to your body physiologically, and why it can possibly be dangerous. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mike Todorovic. Let's take a look at the Valsalva maneuver. First, let's begin with exhalation, more specifically a forceful exhalation like this. What happens when we forcefully exhale? Well, we contract the muscles of our rib cage called the internal intercostals and they bring our rib cage down and inwards. Right. What else happens? Well, we relax the diaphragm and that moves back up. So these two things, you're contracting the internal intercostal muscles, bringing the rib cage down and in, and the diaphragm moves back up. So this reduces the volume of your thoracic cavity. So I've drawn up a thoracic cavity here. And so obviously during this process, by contracting the internal intercostals, we're bringing the rib cage in. And by relaxing the diaphragm, we're allowing for it to snap back up to its normal position. And you can also recruit the muscles of your abdominal wall. And by doing so, you go into this crunch position. This further decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity. Right, now, if my airways are open like they are here, the air forcefully exhales. Wonderful, but if you were to take your airways, like your glottis, for example, and you were to close that glottis, what then happens to the air? It stays inside. This is now the Valsalva maneuver. Forceful exhalation against a closed glottis. Now, what happens to the body in this scenario? Let's take a look. You've got the thoracic cavity, as you can see here, being squeezed upon by various muscles. So you're increasing the pressure inside your thoracic cavity. That's the first thing that's happening. And because the air can't escape, it's further increasing the pressure inside your thoracic cavity. Now let's take a look at the heart. So you can see I've drawn up a very simplistic version of the heart. It obviously doesn't look like this. It's obviously not placed like this or this size within the thoracic cavity, but it's really important when it comes to the Valsalva maneuver because a lot of it has to do with the heart and pressures. So you can see here that we've got the venous return. This is blood coming from the body going back to the heart. Then you've got the blood leaving the heart via the aorta. That's important. Remember, the blood leaving the heart via the aorta has a lot of oxygen and a lot of nutrients. And this blood must be delivered to all the tissues of the body for you to survive. Now, think about this. You're increasing the intrathoracic pressure. You're squeezing all of these vessels and all of these chambers. So you've got a whole bunch of pressure being placed here on the veins, you're gonna have a whole bunch of pressure being placed on the chambers of the heart as well. And you're gonna have a whole bunch of pressure being placed on the aorta. So if I were to take a little probe that measured pressure and stick it inside of the aorta, what do you think it would measure? Is the pressure going up or down? Well, if it's being squeezed upon, the pressure is going to go up. I've drawn a graph here, measuring the aortic pressure. What we see is that, like I said, we've got a normal aortic pressure until we perform this Valsalva maneuver. Remember, forceful exhalation against the closed glottis. And this pressure increases in their aorta transiently. So now you've got a pressure increase. Now think about this. The aorta is delivering oxygen rich and nutrient rich blood to the tissues of the body. If the pressure goes up in the aorta, we've evolved a mechanism to go, wait a minute, the pressure's too high here. I don't want to be delivering blood at this pressure. It's going to damage the organs of my body. So there's receptors in here called baroreceptors that measure the pressure and they send a signal to the nervous system. So remember, the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. The parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. Here, 
after or in response to the increased pressure in the aorta, we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and you get a vagal response because that's the major nerve associated with the parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. And what the vagus nerve does is it travels to the heart and tells the heart to slow down. Why? Because think about it. Right now, the body thinks that there's a lot of blood in here that's being pushed at high pressures. And so it's saying, whoa, 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 slow down. How do we slow that down? By telling the heart rate to slow down. So what you end up finding is that there is a reciprocal and inverse relationship to the pressure in the aorta and the heart rate. So what we've got here is heart rate. So what do you think is happening here? As the aortic pressure goes up, the heart rate goes down reciprocally. Wonderful. This is what we call phase one of the Valsalva maneuver. Phase one, all because of the intrathoracic pressure. Now, this is only happening after like one, two, maybe three seconds. But now think about it. Generally speaking, the heart will undergo diastole, filling, and systole, contraction. And it does this because the diastole, the relaxation and filling, is bringing blood back from the body, venous return into the heart, and it fills the heart up with blood. Then, after it's finished relaxing, the heart contracts and further pushes this blood out to deliver it to the tissues of the body. But because you've got all this pressure being placed on the heart, all this pressure being placed on the veins, what do you think is happening with the venous return? There is no venous return. And so the blood that's filling the heart, it's not filling it up to here, for example. The blood's filling the heart maybe to here. And so when the heart contracts, is there going to be a lot of blood coming out? No, there's very minimal amount of blood exiting the heart going into the aorta. So what do you think that means in regards to the pressure inside the aorta? Because there's not much blood being ejected from the heart, the pressure in the aorta is low. It drops, right? Because it's all about how much blood is being, the blood inside that vessel, how much pressure it's putting on the walls of that vessel. So now what we get is a drop. You get a drop in aortic pressure. So if the pressure in the aorta now drops, think about it. The opposite happens to what happened before, right? Before, the pressure was high. And the body went, whoa, I think you're pushing blood at too high of a pressure. Now think about it, there wasn't even that much blood in there. But it goes, whoa, you're pushing blood at too high of a pressure. What's going on? And it stimulated a vagus response to slow the heart down. But now, because the pressure's dropped so significantly, it's the opposite. It goes, whoa, where's all this blood? We need this blood to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the tissues of the body. So now it doesn't stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. It stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. And now sympathetic neurons innervating the heart tells the heart rate to go up. So again, I told you it's the reciprocal, the opposite. So now the heart rate boosts up. This is phase two. So what do you see has happened so far? We've had an increase in pressure, decrease in heart rate. Then you've got a decrease in pressure, increase in heart rate. You've got stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system, now stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. So your autonomic nervous system is going like this. All right? So what do you think now happens? With the sympathetic nervous system being stimulated, the heart rate's gone up, so it starts to contract more. But in addition, when you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, think about it, when you stimu stimulate, firstly, the parasympathetic nervous system, what did it do? It resulted in a decrease in heart rate, right? But now we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. It resulted in an increase in heart rate, but also an increase in what we call systemic vascular resistance. What does that mean? Well, you've got this vein going back to the heart, right? The vena cava. But there's many veins that lead to it that come from the body. This is just the thoracic cavity. So the pressure increase is only happening here. So what about my legs, for example, and my arms? So remember, you've got all these vessels that need to go back to the heart from the rest of the body. 
So what happens with the sympathetic nervous system is that when you stimulate it, you tell these vessels to constrict, increasing the resistance in them. And that also increases the return of blood back to the heart, right? So you've got blood returning back to the heart. So what do you think that means? Well, it means the next phase is going to be a little bit more blood getting back into the heart. So now it fills it just a little bit more. It's not back to normal because there's all this pressure being placed on these vessels in the heart, but a little bit more blood's going back. And because the heart rate's increased as well, that blood gets ejected a little bit more. So now what you get is a transient increase, just a little increase in the pressure of the aorta. And because of that, well, the pressure's gone up, heart rate goes down. So another parasympathetic stimulation occurs and it goes down. Now, all of this is happening in the Valsalva maneuver. So from here to here, this process, I'll just draw a solid line. This is the Valsalva maneuver. Around about, what, 10 to 15 seconds? All of this is occurring. Phase one and phase two, you got parasympathetic stimulation, sympathetic stimulation, parasympathetic stimulation again, right? All happening here. Now, what happens is you release this Valsalva maneuver. So instead of, that, you relax. You open that glottis back up. And so the air can now escape. What do you think that means to the pressures? All of that pressure being placed upon your thoracic cavities it has gone. All right. So with that pressure gone, what do you think that now means? Well, it now means that it relaxes. So think about it. All that pressure being placed on the aorta now relaxes. Now, if it relaxes, what do you think happens to the pressure inside? It drops again. So the pressure in the aorta now drops again. What do you think that happens to the heart rate? Stimulates the sympathetic nervous system again. And now you get an increase in the heart rate. This is phase three. Happening outside of the Valsalva maneuver. And it's happening because you've relaxed the intrathoracic pressure. But now, after one or two seconds, because the venous return has relaxed, you've now got a huge, all that blood that's pulled in the extremities of your body that couldn't return back to the heart, now rushes back to the heart. And you get all of this blood now filling the heart. So now the heart fills right up with blood. And then it has a really forceful contraction and pushes out huge amounts of blood. And now you've got this huge amount of cardiac output. So the blood leaving the heart is enormous. And so what do we now get? This huge cardiac output that occurs. And because the pressure is now high here, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system again, the vagus nerve, and the heart rate will drop. Now, what do you think that then means? It means the heart rate will drop. This is phase four, and there's only four phases of the Valsalva maneuver. And then, because everything's relaxed, it starts to normalize itself, and it goes back to normal. So, what can you see here that's happening in the Valsalva maneuver? Firstly, at the beginning, phase one, because of the intrathoracic contraction, the pressure in your aorta went up and you had a reciprocal decrease in your heart rate, all because of the stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. But then because everything was uh, impeded, well, the pressure dropped because there was no blood going back to your heart and no blood being ejected from the heart. So the pressure in your aorta plummeted. This is phase two. And because it plummeted, the body freaked out and said, I'm not getting the blood I need. It now stimulated the sympathetic nervous system, increased heart rate. Okay. Now you basically have 
increase return going back to the heart because of the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, heart rate's going up, so you're pumping a little bit more blood out, and you've got systemic vascular resistance. All the blood vessels in your extremities are constricted, bringing some blood back to the heart. So you get this transient increase in pressure, but again, decrease in heart rate. Again, sympathetic nerve, uh, parasympathetic nervous system, vagal stimulation, that's phase three. But then you stop and relax. Valsalva maneuver is finished. You relax, that intrathoracic pressure has gone back to normal. But because of that, all of that blood that was pulled in your venous system can now return back to the heart. And you get this giant increase in pressure again in your aorta. And a reciprocal but inverse stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which drops your heart rate. Then after a while, a few seconds, you go back to normal. Now, you can see Parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic. This fluctuation back and forth is the reason why the Valsalva maneuver is utilized in the first place when it comes to things like supraventricular tachycardia. It helps to get the right signal, either sympathetic or parasympathetic, to the heart to try and bring it back. But the other thing is that the intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure that it generates for weightlifting, I said lifting your 80% uh, of your 1RM. So if you go to do a back squat or a deadlift or whatever it may be, you will reflexively do this. Why? Because the intrathoracic pressure and the intra-abdominal pressure will help create a rigid structure and maintain pressure and hopefully a rigid spine. Now we know that we don't necessarily need a rigid spine for safe and effective movements, but it's a protective mechanism that the body has evolved just in case. All right, what else does it do? Think about when you need to pass a bowel movement. Doing that, well that's just increasing the pressure in your abdominal cavity. That's gonna help push things through. Now the question might be why is this dangerous or how is it dangerous? Well the thing is because you've got fluctuations in parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic, this can be exacerbated or exaggerated in some people. And when you get that parasympathetic stimulation, that rest and digest, that vagus nerve can be stimulated so much that you can pass out. Also, because blood flow is being impeded and then released and impeded and released and pressure changes occur, not enough blood flow can get to the brain. Pass out. So a combination of overstimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system and vagal stimulation and blood pressure alterations some people can pass out and this can become quite dangerous. So hopefully this explanation of the Valsalva maneuver was helpful and now you understand. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.